in, in lieu of an introduction, I'll just say uh, thank you again for, for coming and thank you for, uh, for speaking to us today. And I'm, I'm sure we've got a very uh, interesting talk and a question session in front of us. So um, thank you and welcome to uh, Virginia. It's better to do that after. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, uh, my, as you know, my, my first uh, idea was to speak to you about the absolute, <coughs> the idea of the absolute. But finally, I've, I've been afraid to do that. <laughs> The absolute is a very <coughs> complex thing. And uh, finally, I propose something which is, in fact, a relationship to the absolute, but without the absolute itself, <coughs> and which is <coughs> the negation, the question of negation, the Hegelian question of negation. But before, I want to explain to you what I can name my uh, philosophical strategy. My philosophical strategy, which is uh, finally uh, <coughs> in <coughs> two published books, Being an Event and Logic of the World, and in the third book, which is uh, not published, <laughs> because it is not written. <laughs> but it is a work in progress. <laughs> and so we can assume all that in a few <coughs> words. What was the goal of uh, being an event? With many complexities, the goal was in fact to propose a new concept of truth. For me, it's the most important point. All uh, the ontological level, with the theory of sets and so on, and mathematical background, all that is to prepare the proposition of a new concept of truth. And uh, even the concept of subject, which is very important, is in close relationship with the subject of truth. In fact, finally, being an event, the uh, subject is a point of the process of the truth. <coughs> but in being an event, what was the question concerning this new vision of truth. The question was really an ontological question. The question was what is finally the specific being of a truth? If we have the conviction that finally the form of being is pure multiplicity. What sort of multiplicity is the truth? We cannot say only truth is as all what exists a multiplicity. Because uh, in any case, if you do that, we don't explain what is the singularity of the truth and we don't propose a new concept of the truth. So the precise question was finally, is it possible to identify a truth as a specific form of multiplicity? And it is at this point that I have used the theory of Paul Cohen concerning the generic multiplicity. The most important result of all the construction in being an event is that if 
where truth exists, <coughs> which is not clearly uh, said in being an event. We have a, a theory of truth, but uh, not a theory of existence of truth, in fact. It's not the same thing. So if a truth exists, a truth must be a generic multiplicity. Well, I, I, I don't hear <coughs> enter into the complexity of the precise definition of a generic multiplicity, but <coughs> The philosophical idea is not so complex. A generic multiplicity is a multiplicity which cannot be reduced to a predicate which is in the situation. If you, see, if you part, <coughs> speak uh, of uh, dogs, uh, dogs uh, are defined precisely <coughs> in the situation, and we can say that the dog is a dog with all the predicates of the dog. A generic multiplicity is a multiplicity we cannot be reduced in the language of uh, the situation to that sort of uh, definition. In some sense, uh, generic multiplicity cannot be defined in its singularity as such. For example, in the mathematical theory of uh, generic multiplicity, you cannot distinguish two generic multiplicity. You can distinguish dogs and cats, <coughs> and so on. <coughs> but in some sense, we cannot distinguish between two generic multiplicity. And a generic multiplicity is, for that sort of reason, is finally universal. It's not particular multiplicity, which can be defined with uh, some uh, particular predicates, but it's something that a pure part of uh, the situation, the construction in the situation, we uh, cannot be clearly discernible uh, by the means which are in the situation. And so uh, the, the result of being an event was to propose uh, an ontological definition of truth, a truth is a generic multiplicity, and second, to propose a guarantee concerning the universality of uh, uh, the truth, because precisely it's a multiplicity which is generic and not particular. Okay? But uh, in fact, uh, uh, this first uh, attempt uh, was uh, inside the ontological level, propose an abstract uh, formal definition of the truth, but uh, don't uh, say uh, if really truth exists. <coughs> it's another problem. And the problem of the possible existence of truth is the problem of logic of the world. So the necessity of a second, uh, second book. Now, what is the most uh, important uh, goal of the uh, logic of the world? Is to propose a theory of uh, the apparition of a truth in a concrete world, not an abstract and ontological definition truth, but what is the real phenomena of apparition of the birth and development of the truth inside a concrete world. So it's not the question of the, the pure being of the truth, it's the question of appearing of the truth in the world. And it is why, at the end, it's not the mathematical definition of a truth as a generic multiplicity, but is the definition of a truth in the form of what I name the subjectival body. And so we have a body of the truth, not only the being of a truth, but the body of the truth. <coughs> and all that at the end 
is a meditation concerning the difference between being and existence. All the philosophical questions. <coughs> and the difference between being and existence is applied to the question of truth, because the first book is about the being of truth, and the second is about the possibility of existence of the truth. And uh, in the two books, naturally, the, the dialectics is finally the dialectics of being an event. That is, event is present in naturally being an event, <laughs> but it's also present in logic of the world. So the idea that uh, the birth of a truth is always in the form of an event is maintained, but not in the same goal. In being an event, uh, the event is the possibility of uh, generic multiplicity. See we, if you can escape the clear definition of all multiplicity in the language uh, of the situation, we must have uh, something like a rupture. And this rupture, the name of this rupture, is event. And so we have uh, in the event the name of the, the creation of the possibility of the truth. I, I want to precise very important because there is many bad interpretation of this point. I never say that the event is the truth as such. And very often uh, some uh, readers uh, speak of truth event or something like that. But it's not, it's, not a, it's not the case. The event is only the creation of the possibility of a truth. But not the creation immediate of the truth. And if we define an event in the terms of a rupture which creates the possibility of a truth, we know that an event is an event retroactively. We know that an event is an event if, precisely, we can observe that the possibility of a new truth has been realized. Because the definition of an event is not that something happens. <coughs> it is the definition of a fact. <coughs> but that something happens uh, uh, is not a, a sufficient definition to, to, for an event. An event is the creation of the possibility of a truth, of a new truth. But without the process of construction of a new truth, we don't know that an event is an event. Maybe it's finally only a fact. So it's from the point of view of the truth that we can qualify the event, and the event has, in fact, the birth of the possibility of the truth. <coughs> this precision is very important. There is the point of many, many, many confused. So all that was at the level of being an event, and the result was clear, uh, situation is a pure multiplicity. The state of the situation is the power set of the situation. A rupture, an event, is uh, something which escapes for a moment the action of foundation. So it's something which is without foundation. <coughs> without foundation in the situation. An event is a creation of the possibility of a truth. If we have the process of the truth retroactively, we know that the event is an event. And the active dimension of uh, the construction of the truth is a subject. But all that, the result of all that is the definition of uh, uh, the ontological definition of the truth as a possible uh, generic multiplicity. 
In logic of the world, it's not at all the same thing. In logic of the world, we are not in the pure uh, ontological level of the situation. We are in a situation with uh, transcendental organization of the element of the situation. It is why we transit from theory of sets to theory of categories. <coughs> Because uh, finally, the, 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 the transcendental of the situation, I, I don't enter into technical details, but the transcendental of the situation, which is the structure of order, the order structure, constitute uh, finally, uh, by different operations, uh, the thing like the boss, <coughs> and uh, even finally, precisely, uh, the Grotendic topos. <coughs> So, immediately in logic of the world, we are confronted with a question of relation, not only with a question of pure being as such, that is the question of multiplicity. Because in a world, all multiplicities are uh, with <coughs> transcendental evaluation. And so, uh, uh, every multiplicity is not reduced to its proper being, there is also the relationship between a multiplicity and all the other multiplicities with, uh, as a primitive relationship, identity and difference. And so uh, the world is first uh, multiplicity where we have uh, the means to distinguish between two multiplicities at a qualitative level. They are different. Uh, or they are not different, or they are uh, <coughs> not absolutely the same, uh, or they are uh, very different, but uh, not completely different, and so on. So we have a sort of uh, ramification, a sort of uh, uh, multiplicity, not of multiplicity, but of relationship between multiplicities, and between multiplicities and the elements of the transcendental. So technically, all that is... Uh, <coughs> some sense uh, as the complexity of the mathematical construction, but even here the, the, the idea is simple. The idea is uh, to define what is a world, a concrete world. But why? Because if you want to uh, study the birth and the reality, the concrete reality of the truth, you must define what is a concrete world. We cannot uh, stay in multiplicity as such, that is the ontological level, and to, to go from uh, the very <coughs> abstract essence of truth to its existence, we must have a complete theory of what is the world, logic of the world. <coughs> and inside this logic, we have a new definition of a truth. The truth is <coughs> not reduced to the abstract uh, definition of uh, generic multiplicity, a truth is precisely defined by the apparition of a new form of existence. Of a new form of existence, not a new form of being, but a new form of existence. That is a new form of intensity of existence. Because uh, finally, the birth of truth at this level is the apparition of uh, the multiplicity which has a very strong intensity, in fact the maximal intensity in the situation, and which go from a very weak intensity to a very strong intensity. So an event is as a qualitative definition, it's not only a rupture in the laws of the uh, situation, is uh, much more the positive affirmation of something in its proper intensity, maxima, coming from, uh, uh, from practically uh, uh, nothing at all. So the, the international, we are nothing, we must become all. <coughs> The international is 
that I live uh, the music of the, the birth of the troops. <coughs> and so, uh, that is the, 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 the passage concerning the truth, which is a central concept of all my philosophy, from the ontological level to the existential level. To being, to existence. We encounter immediately one very interesting point. Set theory is always inside classical logic. What is classical logic? We know that. From Aristotle. Classical logic is a logic with principle of identity. A is the same. <coughs> principle of non contradiction. We cannot have concerning the same thing simultaneously in the same place at the same time. A and non A. And third, the principle of the excluded leader. If you have any proposition, maybe P, either P is true, either P is false. There is no third possibility. So classical logic is the framework of uh, analytic vision. And it's a logical framework of a classical set theory. So, for me, there is this consideration that the ontological level is logically classic. And why the uh, <coughs> ontology is classic? It's because uh, the point is the, that the equality between two sets is reducible to the fact that the set has the same elements. So, <coughs> if, you, if you have two sets A and B, you have <coughs> for two ticks, X Equivalent at x of the This is the, the foundation of the fact that the logic of uh, the theory of set is the classical logic, because we cannot have uh, uh, we cannot have the possibility that which is inside a set and which is outside the set <coughs> will be equal. So, uh, the, this principle, which is the principle of extensionality, extensionality is the ontological <coughs> text for classical logic. So, <coughs> in fact, if you read the treatise of the theory of sets, you, you, you constate it's a, it's a, it's a framework of the, of the classical logic. A very important point in classical logic is that the double negation is the same thing that affirmation. So you have, I, 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 I got like that negation. So you have Double negation of I is the same of I. And that why it is so important? It's important because with this formula uh, we can have demonstration by absurdity, <coughs> negative demonstration. 
because to prove up, you can prove no, no up. <coughs> okay? So, and this the, the ontologically very important from the very beginning, because the, the, that sort of uh, demonstration is present inside Parmenides, c'est quoi? And it's very often the most important use of classical logic. Well, well, <coughs> you do that. You suppose that you suppose that no high is true. And you have a proof that if no A is true, uh, all the thinking is inconsistent. So you prove that uh, some, some thing like, like that. <coughs> Maybe. So from the hypothesis that no A is true, you have as a consequence something which is uh, impossible. So it is uh, impossible that no A is true. But if no A is false, by the principle of the excluded middle, A is true. Okay? So, by the hypothesis that no A is true, by the consequence which is impossible, finally the conclusion is A is true. But you know that all that is possible because A égale non non A. So there is a close relationship between the result, the general result of uh, ontological conception in the form of theory of sets and, uh, and the principle, the logical principle of uh, double negation. And the most important point is that we can demonstrate, not directly, but by the falsity of the negation, the truth of both are. It's a, a, it's a very strange situation. In fact. When we, we do mathematics, we, we, we do that. Uh, <laughs> it's a very strange situation. Because in fact, during all this sequence, we know that we are in falsité. <laughs> so we know that you are uh, create consequences of something false. And you search, we search a conclusion which is really impossible. Because maybe uh, this thing has many consequences. You must find an absurd consequence. When you are find an absurd consequence, you can, <coughs> you know that are uh, so at the level of uh, being as such, we have uh, the classical context, we have the double negation identical to affirmation, and finally we have the proof, the indirect proof, by negation. And you know you, you enter here inside the question of negation. But you can see here that negation in the classical context is a very uh, strong uh, operation for proofs. B because you, you prove the falsity of non A and not, in fact, directly the truth of A. And this is why uh, it's an uh, 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 indirect proof. Because in some sense, you don't say the thing concerning A. <coughs> You begin with nona, you stay in nona, you find something impossible, and hop, oh, A is true. Never you say something of A. <coughs> you explore initially the negation of A. At the level of existence, the situation is completely different for uh, empirical reasons. If we have a transcendental 
of the situation, we prescribe uh, the intensity of existence. You have many forms of intensity. We can be absolutely strong in the situation, in the world, we can be weak in the world, we can, and so on. Maybe we can have infinity of different possibilities to be in the world. I can be the world, the world, and so on. <coughs> and so uh, we cannot have uh, uh, classical logic. We cannot have classical logic be because we cannot have excluded middle. We are not in the point either A or non A. We have many things before the two. For example, I am completely the situation, but I am not completely the situation, and so on and so on, and I am practically no in the situation. All that is concrete experience. You know perfectly that the, the light can be very strong, very weak, and so on. So in the concrete world, we cannot have a, 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 a classical context. The logic of the world is generally, generally it's a generality, we can, act, we can construct a world with the classical logic, but it's not generality, it's intuitionistic logic. <coughs> In intuitionistic logic, we have the principle of identity, we have the principle of non-contradiction, we cannot have A and non-A simultaneously, but we have not the excluded middle. And so we cannot have the indirect proof. In the intuitionistic world, as in the world, if you must affirm something concerning uh, an object, then you, you must have a direct proof of what you are saying. In some sense, is the fact that we are at the level of existence, that existence is no uh, a pure opposite to non-existence, there is something between the two, you can exist more or less, so we cannot have a logical, classical logical, and so we cannot have excluded people. And it's very important to completely understand the philosophical consequences. The philosophical consequences is that ontology is classical, and phenomenology description of the world is intuitionistic. So between being and existence, there is not only a difference of level, a difference of singularity, a difference of abstraction, but there is purely and simply a logical difference. The, the logical framework is not the same. And uh, it is why, for example, an event has not exactly the same function. If you observe uh, the ontological determination of an event, the event is a suspension of the axiom of foundation, so either the axiom of foundation is not here, or it is here by the logical context. And so we have a sort of a formal definition of an event. In a concrete world, it's different because we must have a, a measure of the intensity of what happens. And if we have many forms of intensity, that is the general case, and you are in the framework of intuitionistic logic, the question of the very existence of the event itself is complex. Because we can always say, finally, uh, it's not really strong. <coughs> when we discuss uh, of an event, 
uh, we, we perfectly know this situation. One can say, uh, oh, this fact is very important, it's a considerable event, and so on, and something else. You know, it's uh, not, so, not so important, and so on. So the discussion concerning the event has not the radicality, uh, which is the case in the ontological level. So we have two uh, frameworks at the level of uh, being at the level of existence. And you, you know that the fundamental difference is the difference of negation. Because excluded middle is a law of negation. Either P or P. So, the, 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 the crucial point is the negation. In uh, the classical context, negation is, in some sense, the radical distinction with affirmation. You affirm or you negate. That is the signification of the principle of the excluded middle. You affirm or you, affirm, you negate. There is nothing between. In the intrinsic context, is not the case between P and P. Maybe there is other possibilities. And so we can say that uh, uh, the negation is uh, stronger in classical logic and is weaker in intuitionistic logic. Because in intuitionistic logic, it's not a pure opposition between the two terms, but only a quasi-opposition. And in uh, the classical uh, context, it's uh, purely and simply an opposition because we cannot have a third possibility. So, we have two fundamental framework at the level of uh, pure ontology and at the level of uh, existence in a concrete world. And finally, the event in all that. <coughs> the being, existence, event. The event is a very difficult case. It's a very difficult case for a point which is very precise. An event is a rupture in the situation. But we have no proof that it's really a rupture in the situation. We have no proof, no guarantee. Because finally, it's only in the retroaction of the truth that uh, the event has a guarantee as an event. So during a sequence, which can be a long sequence, we have the possibility of affirmation of the event as an event and affirmation of the <coughs> negation of the event as an event. Because there is something indecidable between the two. Because the event as is reality in the truth, finally. So in the future, it's only from the point of view of the construction of the future and so on, that uh, finally an event is an event. And uh, especially when you are inside the event as such, you are, uh, many people, we are in the event, many people are not in the event, and the question of the event as an event is uh, not uh, established. So, in the case of the event, and in the relationship of the event as such to the situation, we have a new logic because we have not the principle of non-contradiction. We have not the principle of non-contradiction because we have simultaneously the possibility of affirmation of the potency of the event and of affirmation of the impotency of the event, all that being maybe one day uh, 
with confirmation uh, when uh, everybody uh, is thinking that uh, we have here a truth. But we know that uh, very often it's a very long time. <coughs> Maybe uh, even today uh, we can find people uh, which affirm that the French Revolution was not uh, a good event, uh, <laughs> was not an event, absolutely possible. So during a very long time, uh, the, the, the certainty of the event is uh, not uh, uh, affirmed. Affirm. And so when we have discussion concerning an event and the beginning of the consequences of an event and uh, uh, when we are the militant of an event and so on, in some sense we are the context of a logic without the principle of contradiction. That is, we cannot convince somebody that it is an event by saying it is an event. Because see, if we say, no, it's not an event, <coughs> the discussion is closed. You, you can only say that it's an event by the production of some consequences which are in the direction of universality, but there is no absolute, uh, uh, <coughs> absolute opposition between affirmation and negation. And so we are in a context, in a logical context, can have something like that. That is the explicit negation of the principle of non-contradiction. Affirmation, P, and affirmation of the negation, and P, and simultaneously. That sort of uh, logic is named the paraconsistent. level concerning being, truth, subject, is the classical principle. Principle of non-contradiction, principle excluded middle, identity. Conclusion, at this level we have a strong negation, the maximality of the strength of negation. At the level of the world, that is the level of ordinary existence, we have intuitionistic logic. We have the principle of non-contradiction, but we have not the principle of excluded middle. At the level of event and consequences of the event, that is the concrete process of in fact, you are in a context which is in paraconsistent logic. And the negation is more and more weak. The maximal strength of the negation is the classical context. The internistic context, we have a weaker uh, negation. And in the paraconsistent context, we are weaker than we <laughs> negation, because negation is not able to separate non P and non P. So, the com complete theory of truth cannot be reduced to one logical context. One logical context. It's very important. Yet not only there is a change of situation and of thinking between the ontological level, the world level, the existence and being, and so on, but we have the change, uh, the circulation between three different logics. 
the point is that is the circulation between three forms of negativity, three different negations. Or you know that negation, in any case, when we have to create something, like a new truth, negation is very important. Why? Because a creation is always something new, and something new is always, in some sense, a negation of what it is. And so, if a truth is a creation after the possibility opened by an event, this creation is certainly a form of negation, something which is an exception inside the world. But this negation is a complex construction. It's not a simple negation. It's a context uh, uh, of uh, event and world and being, because it's sort of a uh, combination, a sort of mixture of uh, classical negation, intuitionistic negation, and paraconsistent negation. All that has very important political consequences, as an example. Because if you think that the political event and the political truth is uh, from the very beginning to the end in the classical context, you have a very strong opposition with enemies, absolute opposition with enemies. Because that is the strength of the classical negation. With you and the negation of you, there is no uh, possibility, there is no self possibility. So you are in exclusion of all compromise in the political field. And the tendency, if you think like that, is to think that uh, there is no other relationship to enemies, that destruction is, in some sense, uh, it's a result of the conviction that the logic is classical. If uh, between P and P there is no relationship at all, finally the destruction of uh, the negation, or the negation of the affirmation, is uh, the only uh, way. And it is why, if you think that the classical logic is the entire logic of the political process, you are in the side of violence, inevitably. Violence, which is the consequence of antagonistic contradiction. Because antagonistic contradiction is, in fact, another name for classical contradiction. If you think that all the process of the truth is the intuitionistic, is intuitionistic, you eliminate practically the case of antagonism. And so uh, you are in a weak reformism. <coughs> <coughs> Because you are always saying there is many uh, uh, possibilities between uh, what I affirm and what I affirm the other B, there is many uh, different things possible, and we can uh, find uh, a compromise. <laughs> and if you are thinking that the, all, all the context is uh, paraconsistent, you are is a way in the conclusion that the best is to do nothing. <coughs> because finally we cannot decide. We cannot decide. You are unable to decide. So in the first case we have violence, in the second case we have a compromise, 
And in the third case, we have nothing at all. <coughs> that is impotency. And so, uh, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, create the situation where we must have a choice between uh, the logic. The conclusion is that all uh, explicit and authentic process of a political clause is across the three logics. So there are moments for the compromise, there are moments for the antagonistic action, there is a moment where we must fight the enemy, it's a possibility, there is a moment where we must, we must have compromise, there is a moment even where it's uh, better to be quiet. <coughs> And, uh, and all, all that compose uh, a very complex sequence uh, uh, of uh, politics. And as an exercise for you, you can uh, uh, apply that, this one, for example, uh, as to artistic creation, because it's true also for artistic creation. That is, is artistic creation is a pure rupture with academic style, all, all, the, all the painting and so on, La classical logic, antagonistic pictural creation. Is it a con constantly a compromise because uh, there is no pure beginning, absolute beginning, but you are always in compromise with some uh, uh, <coughs> existent art existent? Or is there so so indecidable that the uh, final is the best is uh, to abandon And even in artistic creation, it's the same thing. And we must absolutely uh, uh, see in uh, uh, the work of art and see the, 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 the three logic. We can see what is coming from the past. We can see what is new. And we can see also what is indecidable, which is between the new and the ancient style without a, a, a decision between the two. And, and so on. So uh, we are near my end. <coughs> and I return to my strategic vision. <laughs> Finally, my first book was in logical context. <coughs> classical nature. The second was in an intuitionistic context, largely, because uh, in general, a topos is uh, the internal logic of a topos, possible to define the internal logic of a topos. The internal logic of a topos is of intuitionistic nature. And in any case, from the, in the first book and the second book, the question of the event was, in fact, paraconsistent because of the fact that there is a suspension of the truth for uh, the decision concerning the event. And so, in my work in progress, <coughs> I must clarify all that, as I clarify here. Uh, <coughs> I must clarify all that, that is, I must propose on examples and so on, uh, the possibility of the interplay between different logical contexts. It is not simple. Finally, a truth is always a form of a mixture, compromise between three different uh, logical contexts. But to, to, to give a proof of that, to examine clear example of that is uh, uh, very, very, very complex. And I think it's uh, very important because in some sense today we are in a, in a logical fight. A logical fight. We have the apparition of new forms of a pure antagonistic contradiction with murder, with violence, uh, and so on. Uh, violence without limits, in some sense. That is the very intense 
Merci beaucoup. Le temps de dire ça, il me il verrait oui qu'il puisse se distinguer bijou. So, under the name of democratic vision, but maybe democracy is something else that uh, purely intuitionistic logic, constant compromise. So it's very important, I think, to find a new way where we organize the creation, the action, and so on, across the three logic without concession to the pure violence, but without resignation, so <coughs> even <coughs> to nothing, or to uh, compromise without strong signification. And so it's a concrete problem of truth today. The question of truth today is clearly the question of the, the possibility to go across the apparent divisions to create, to accept the existence of a process which is across the three logics, and so which uh, sometimes is in the principle of non-contradiction, sometimes is not in the principle of non-contradiction, sometimes is in the law of the excluded middle, and sometimes is in the law <coughs> an and it is why, and it will be my conclusion, the tactical existence of truth today, the possibility of a clear vision of what is the process of truth, so the tactical, the subjective tactical vision, is the question of the multiplicity of logic. I would have a question. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, just a clarification, actually. Um, when you talked about art at the end of your presentation, mm -hmm. um, what got me thinking uh, in terms of the three logics that you were talking about, um, it sounded to me that. Um, in an art historical sense, there was this time when we were clearly able to distinguish object A is not an artwork and object B is an artwork, as in classical art when we have sculpture and oil paintings and all these things. And then there was a movement away from that in the sense that we got to a point where we accepted more things into what we thought art is and more and more people started accepting that and then in the end some people just dropped the question altogether because everything could be art and nothing could be art at the same time is that is that in any way do i get that right or is that in any way well, absolutely correct yeah <laughs> you're absolutely yeah. correct but the the the, the, the final vision which uh, comes uh, from uh, Duchamp and so mm -hmm. on. That is, uh, every object is an artistic object by itself, mm -hmm. is uh, absolutely paraconsistent. Because the object or the destruction of the object can be simultaneously. There is many performances today uh, which are the destruction of an object or the destruction of something as equivalent to the creation of something. Mm -hmm. So destruction and creation are the same thing in some sense, and so we are in a paraconsistent logic. So 
is true that uh, classical art is much more uh, in classical logic. Impressionism, for example, in painting, is clearly impressionistic because it is a mixture of different vision, mm -hmm. different uh, lights, and so on. And uh, a part uh, of contemporary art is uh, clearly paraconsistent, that is, the equivalence between art and non-art, <coughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, maybe we 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 must uh, accept to to go in a, in a new sequence, uh, which recapitulates the three, mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, which is uh, which, which <coughs> constructs something which is across the three. Yeah. So with. Uh, with uh, something which has uh, elements of uh, the classical solidity, if you want, the classical strands, uh, elements of uh, the, the, the complex uh, acceptation of many uh, forms, and also the acceptation, but as a part uh, and not as a totality, mm -hmm. of uh, the paraconsistent equivalence between uh, construction and, uh, and, and, and destruction. And uh, it's uh, the art of the future. <laughs> but it's not okay. I think I think today we we are at the point where in all the fields uh, we have this question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Arthur. Uh, and then, okay, I'll do you in the order I saw you. So Arthur, Jan, uh, and then uh, Andrew. Uh, apologies for this, perhaps too playful question. In previous incarnations of your talking about the three negations, you've always talked about the fact that in a situation where you eliminated both the principle of non-contradiction and the principle of the excluded middle, it would result in chaos. Mm -hmm. But a couple of years ago, I went to a paper by Slavoj Žižek, that ally enemy, um, and he postulated an idea of precisely this fourth negation in which one is trying to think, in a way, about um, both uh, the elimination of the principle of non contradiction and the principle of the excluded middle. And I, I think, from what I remember, he was likening that to something that he does with, say, Herman Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener in, in relation to the, the, the simple statement, um, I prefer not to, which may actually end up squaring somewhat with some things that Brian was saying earlier today with this sort of philosophical subject. Sorry for co-opting you into my, into my question, Brian. Um, so I, I just wanted to know whether you would have a comment. Would you still agree with your previous assertion that to eliminate both principles would just end in chaos? Certainly, certainly, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's my position, certainly terror is uh, the, the, it's the result of the conviction that social and political field is of ontological nature, that is in classical logic. And it is when you have the conviction that the political situation is strictly a question of death or life. Or death or life is the form of uh, the principle of uh, non-contradiction in the violent context of uh, politics, of war, and so on. Death or life. And uh, uh, I, I, I think that the, the problem is that when you say that, when you are in this conviction, uh, we cannot stop. You cannot stop because logical context, if it is the only uh, context, uh, is finally the production of uh, infinite negation. And it's the definition of terror. 
terror is infinite negation. Because there are always enemies. Because any contradiction creates a new enemy. And so, uh, finally, it's a destructive vision of emancipation. <coughs> and it's really a, 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 a logical point. And so we must uh, uh, absolutely distinguish and affirm that in all situations, without exception, uh, we have always different sort of logic. And so we cannot impose, for example, the classical logic in the form of terror to all the situations. Sometimes we must fight. I am not uh, innocent. Sometimes we must fight. But sometimes it's not the general law. It's not the general law. And even in the fight, there is always many different manners to have some different logic. For example, if uh, uh, if you are if you have prisoners, uh, you kill the prisoners or uh, you discuss with them and so on. And uh, we have many examples in that sort of direction but that exists the possibility to restrain the terror, to, 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 to displace the classical music. And so the, today is the very important question. It's a very important question, but I, say, I think I insist on the point that we can define the philosophical situation today, but much more than the philosophical situation, finally all the concrete situation where the question of uh, novelty, of creation, of uh, apparition of something new is, uh, is the case, we are absolutely in the point to, 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 to go across the multiplicity of logic. And we cannot reduce the situation to the strict opposition, which is in some sense a classical opposition between classical logic and the intuitionistic logic. So, uh, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the reintroduction of classical logic in the field of relation between the logic. And it's generally our situation. Okay, on one side, uh, horrible uh, classical logic with uh, murder, terror, and so on. On the other side, but pay or don't pay, <laughs> on the other side, uh, uh, white democracy uh, with uh, election and, uh, and uh, human rights. But this is, uh, in fact, uh, an example of classical logic. Classical logic applied to a uh, form of logic. It's not the way. The way is the interplay between uh, the different logic and not their classical opposition. This is why the, the, the long discussion between uh, uh, revolution on one side and reform on the other side has been uh, without any real effect, finally. It was uh, rhetoric, because it was the, the logical abstraction applied to the different uh, uh, orientation, uh, political orientation. <coughs> <clears throat> it's not the question is not really about this presentation, but it's a more general question. <clears throat> I think, um, and it's maybe a question that is a bit subver subversive uh, in this master class. Um, but um, I was wondering um, how important, like um, mathematics, would be for the whole of your work, because my own approach to your work is more historical. I think. Um, I'm a big fan of, for example, uh, Bruno Bosdale's work on your work. Um, and I always uh, thought of the role of mathematics um, as an instance of a more, um, another concern, which is like a formalist concern. Um, but as I'm seeing um, all the presentations here, who were today and tomorrow, um, I have the impression that it's, um, whereas I always thought of mathematics as like a means um, to go to a point, I have, and not that mathematics was the point itself, I had the impression that um, today or there are some, um, some readers of your, your work who make mathematics like the point itself, and that's why I was wondering um, 
how important is mathematics really for you? You, you know, my, my, my use of, uh, of uh, mathematics is uh, uh, only the direction to, to give a precise definition to some concepts of philosophical nature. So my use of mathematics is not inside mathematics. It's, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't create new mathematics or something like that. So it's not uh, a mathematician use of mathematics. It's a philosophical use of mathematics. And why this philosophical use of mathematics? It's because I think really that mathematics is ontology. That is, mathematics is the science of the, all the possible forms, uh, uh, the, 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 the inconsistent multiplicity is able. So mathematics is ontology in a, in a very precise sense. Uh, if all what exists is inconsistent multiplicities, that is in some sense, uh, uh, the cow is the sense of the law, right? the, the, the big difference between the two, pure and consistent. Mathematics is the science which organizes the knowledge of all formal possibilities of uh, inconsistent multiplicities to become consistent. So my definition of mathematics is the knowledge of the possible consistency of uh, inconsistent multiplicity. We can say in a more uh, platonic style, mathematics is the science of forms, all forms, and without any uh, vision of uh, concrete realization of the forms. In some sense, uh, 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 one day, uh, we know that uh, uh, imaginary numbers uh, can be useful in electricity, <laughs> but it's, it's the creation of imaginary numbers has no relationship with electricity. And so, so mathematics is the, the, the creation of a, a new knowledge of all possible forms, all formal virtualities, to speak of Deleuze now, once more, uh, all potentiality of uh, multiplicity as such. Multiplicity as such being consistent multiplicity. And so we must use mathematics at this level. If mathematics is the science of the possible forms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of consistent being, we certainly can use uh, this uh, knowledge of forms at uh, the philosophical level. And uh, when uh, I say that a situation is a, multi is a multiple, that uh, nature is composed of ordinals and so on, all that is not at all mathematical uh, uh, intent. It's purely philosophical intent, but with the help of uh, mathematics and under the condition of mathematics. It's the same thing when at the level of the world. When I say, uh, finally, uh, uh, a world is composed of uh, a system, a complex system of identities and differences composed uh, with a, a structure of order and so on, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a formalization of uh, philosophical questions. And uh, it's not... A, a, mathematical new discovery. So uh, I, th I think really that uh, if mathematics is the general science <coughs> on one side concerning the different possible forms of multiplicity, on the other side the possible interplay of relationship, of, of relations, which is a theory of category, if, 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 if mathematics is that, it's naturally very useful uh, for a philosophy. And after that, I can define, uh, I can define uh, the difference, for example, between existence and being, which is certainly not uh, 
but you could have quit. <laughs> but, <coughs> which is clarified, which is clarified by uh, the, the use of, uh, for example, the contrast between the theory of sets on one side and theory of category on the other. I had a question about the paraconsistence logic. Uh, what's the difference between that and mysticism? And mysticism. Because you know, you have your antagonistic classical verse, either P or not P. You have your reformist uh, well, <laughs> and then you have your hippie, P and <laughs> no, I agree with you sometimes. It's, it's, you. it's a possibility. Uh, 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 you know, it's also in your question, we, we have many possible use of mathematics because in some sense it's always a metaphorical use. Because the only strict use of mathematics is mathematics. So, so me and you, we have, uh, we have also something as a metaphor. For you, and if you say that there is something uh, mystical, I, I agree with you. It does not perfectly what I mean. And uh, in some sense, uh, I agree with you also because in the discussion concerning an event, uh, there is always a, a moment where uh, the, the, the person which who affirms the event must accept the existence of a person which don't affirm, it does not affirm the event. And it's, uh, uh, we, must, uh, we must not transform the discussion concerning the event in an antagonistic contradiction. It has been the, uh, the terrible history of practically all religions. Uh, for example, the resurrection of Christ, uh, the Christian event. But if you if you if you begin to kill uh, everybody with saying oh no this is a story of resurrection I don't I don't agree we are not in the true religion you transform the paraconsistency of religion which must accept that uh, there exist uh, non-religious people in something else and we transform in fact the religion into a political power which is uh, the destiné many uh, religions in the world. And so it's certainly better to have a mystic interpretation. <coughs> and we know, it. in fact, uh, the, the best side of practically all religion is mysticism. <coughs> because it's a, it's a, mysticism is a, is a peaceful vision of uh, transcendence. <coughs> I can get, carry on with um, paraconsistent logic because that's what I wanted to ask you about too. And I think it has a certain kind of bearing on the question about aesthetics. It certainly does as far as I'm concerned. Um, is there not another way of thinking about paraconsistent logic which will sound as though it's pointing in the direction of mysticism but I don't think does necessarily at all in the end? And that is that one pushes paraconsistent logic to a point of radical aporia where one has to make the leap elsewhere. And you yourself, I mean, Brian is bringing this up with Sartre in a way, but you yourself cover what's perhaps the great example of it, which is Kierkegaard. Um, but Kierkegaard, yes, I know we bring, it sounds as I'm trying to smuggle religion in all over again, but I think Kierkegaard is merely an example. And the risk, of course, of this leap elsewhere is that you end up like Don Quixote getting beaten up all the way along the road, but at least, like Joyce, you will have said, I am not I am not afraid to be wrong and to be damned for all eternity. I, I agree. But in, in some sense my posi my personal position uh, is always that uh, uh, the, the, the context of the paraconsistent context is always a context which is also the context of the sequence. Uh, uh, for example, the discussion of the reality or non-reality of an event is uh, inside also the becoming of a truth, so the process of the construction of a truth. So we have more and more possible arguments in the discussion. 
more and more, or, or maybe uh, less and less. <coughs> but, and so I think that the very use of paraconsistent situation is really discussion. Discussion. If, not, if we are not mystical, we must be in discussion. And discussion without, in some sense, neither violence nor compromise. Nor compromise. And it's a very essence of, of politics. But, but not, not only of politics. The, the ability to be uh, in your conviction without the idea, the classical idea, to destroy everybody which is not in the conviction, but also with the idea to, 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 to abandon, in fact, your conviction for uh, compromise, for uh, and so on. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly the, the position of Socrates in, in, in the di dialogue of Plato, even with the sophists, which are in the need, <coughs> is discussion. Discussion. And even if the discussion has no result, we maintain the principle of discussion. Many uh, dialogues of Plato has no conclusion, you know. So. Uh, finally, at the end, uh, everybody is uh, practically in the same uh, position. But we must continue. We must continue. It's uh, like in Beckett. I cannot continue. I must continue. <coughs> Okay, so I think we'll take uh, one final question from Brian and then we'll go towards our uh, uh, reception. Hi, um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could say maybe something about how these three types of no, logic... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not too quickly. Okay. Um, if you could say something about how these three types of logic um, relate back to the three forms of subjectivity that you sort of, um, describe in, in logics of world. Because it seems to me that uh, in the way that you're talking, but maybe the faithful subject is no longer the simple hero, if you like, that, that he initially appears, and these sort of more negative forms of subjectivity uh, are neither you know, simply these sort of evil subjects anymore. So to read you simplistically would be just to map that onto it and see those three subjective figures as antagonistic. Mm -hmm. But what you seem to be saying is, in terms of the actual material historical unfolding of an event, mm -hmm. these three characters are essential to the actual change that is, that is going to occur. So I wonder if you could just say something about if you would rename perhaps those three subjective figures and I, how you would relate them to these types of logic. Yes, I think I think that uh, your, your question is a very interesting one. I think that, you know, uh, if you observe the relationship between the faithful subject to the reactive one, and to the obscure one. Finally, we can say something like that. My relationship to uh, faithful subjectivity is in some sense classical, because we agree uh, concerning yes or no. My relationship to reactive subjectivity is intuitionistic, because it's a possibility to discuss and so on. And my relationship to obscure subjects is antagonistic. So is, uh, uh, is uh, really uh, classical in the, in, the, in the strong sense. But in fact, maybe you, we must, uh, uh, we must uh, have the attitude, the, the choice to apply even to the obscure subject a paraconsistent vision. There is a, a <coughs> you, 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 you know, uh, <coughs> Mao Zedong uh, in his book about contradiction distinguished clearly uh, antagonistic contradiction and contradiction into the people. Of course, in fact, the first important text concerning the multiplicity of logics inside the political field. There are two different contradictions. And so,
when we discuss with inside the hall, we discuss of what is true or false with arguments and so on, and as long as possible. When we have with enemy is antagonistic contradiction, so we are more and more classical. Okay. But in the same text and after more and more, Mao says that if it is possible, we can uh, have to antagonistic contradiction the relationship that we have with contradiction inside the world. So if it is possible, we must apply to uh, classical logic, <coughs> antagonistic, strong opposition, the same subjective method that we apply with the discussion inside people, which are between intuitionistic uh, and uh, classical uh, 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 logic. So it's it's a, a very profound idea. Uh, after all, uh, we must uh, uh, assume that the responsibility to uh, violence and antagonism is on the side of the enemy. So we must have only defensive violence, not offensive. But have, we have an offensive violence when we are not in the pure classical logic. We cannot have the will to eliminate the enemy. We have only the goal to protect your uh, conviction and uh, your uh, position. And it is uh, the, some examples of the, the very subtle problem of the going across the different Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so um, I'll say again thank you uh, for that talk and uh, thank you for uh, all the speakers so far today and uh, thank you to everyone for um, being here and uh, engaging in such so, a... So, one word more, the paper, the mysterious paper. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, only a formal exposition of the trilogy, and it's a very good exercise to read the paper with uh, all what I have said, and to, uh, to see in a formal, pure, purely a formal presentation, what is common to the trilogy and what is different. We have au début the axiom of uh, natural deduction, which are common to all uh, logic. And after that, we have the axiom of classical negation, the axiom for intuitive negation, the axiom for paraconsistent negation, and after that, some commentary concerning all that. Uh, formally, it's not uh, very difficult. Uh, there is a symbol, uh, the absolutely classical symbol of uh, implication uh, and so on, and uh, the negation has uh, distinguished and classical negation and so on. And so I think that the, to read this paper will be a sort of good exercise. <coughs>